Hey, hi everyone. I'm Rashid Ogunlaru, coach, speaker, author of Soul Trader, putting the heart back into your business. And I'm wearing the t-shirt today, you can see. And somebody else who's wearing a t-shirt <laughs> of a different kind. I'm delighted to be joined by um, Albert Francis. Now, Albert, it would be great if you would introduce yourself because you know when it comes to the things about introducing people, which of their many titles and their many accomplishments to, to give. I wonder if you'll be happy to sorry, you. sorry to interrupt. We, do, we have a technical problem. Aha. Uh -huh. Am I bouncing back? Oh, I tell you what that might be. I tell you what that might be. That might be that you, you've got us playing back on another line. Is that the case? Wait, something is happening here. I don't... Wait, wait a second. Oh, I know what it is. I'm playing in, a, in another screen. I'm probably playing, playing live in a different screen. <laughs> it's playing with a delay of about like 10 seconds or so, all of a sudden in, in another, on an, on another browser tab, I just noticed. So... So I didn't just, hear the last thing you said. You know what? It's interesting, Albert, though, weren't we? We were just, before we went live, we were just joking <laughs> about the joys of something that's live and kind of spontaneous. So um, we love that. You know, we love that. So, Albert, over to you, yourself. Well, that, that's so funny because, yeah, that's right. We, we were just talking. You said, okay, we're going to go live. And I, actually, I didn't know that the interview would be live. So I assumed, okay, we'll be able to edit uh, or whatever, because I'm sure I'll invariably make some mistake or something will go wrong. And before we even get started, something just <laughs> goes wrong. <laughs> Absolutely. So it's okay. I'm going to jump in there then, Albert, because I'm going to do a little bit of the brief introduction of you, then go back to the introduction of you. So you're an accomplished pianist. Like myself, you're a coach. You're a speaker. You're also an entrepreneur, and we'll probably get onto that. And um, you've seen all sorts of ups and downs. You've recorded CDs. You've talked. I, I, I've got the thing that you work internationally. But the one thing that's really funny about this thing about us going live is I'd imagine that when you're doing a really high-level concert, like pianist live performance, you've got to get it right, right? So how do you how do you cope with that pressure of when you've got to? You, when you know there's, there's no second take, I just I, maybe let's just jump in there. Oh, you, yeah, you're jumping right in. So you, you're like twisting the knife here. <laughs> this, is, this is actually a difficult thing, and it's a, it's a major challenge because I, I find I've, I've always been a perfectionist, and, and part of classical music training is, really is perfectionism because sometimes it seems like I, it's, I, maybe it's a matter of supply and demand, just like if you have like this many applicants for applications for, for a job and like a lot of them are qualified, then how, how do people d decide? So you get the same thing in classical music, wh whether it's an audition for getting into a conservatory or it's a, a competition of some sort. And then, you know, I, I have had experiences where like one time, this is very painful, like, like early on, I, I performed at a piano competition and afterwards the head judge came up to me and said, oh, you were the most musical and the most talented, but so-and-so uh, didn't make any, didn't, didn't play the, any wrong notes or whatever. It's all oh, great. Thanks. <laughs> so, so that, that's actually a pain point and, and it's actually changing. Uh, in this age of technology nowadays, mm -hmm. because now the, w one of the things that I, that I think we classical music musicians should make every single effort to do is reach more audiences, reach younger audiences, reach different audiences, and perform it in unconventional venues. It, it, it shouldn't, like a lot of people still are apprehensive if, about going to a concert hall, and it seems like, you know, there are too many formalities. So the, I, I personally, I do happen to like some of the formalities. I'm, I'm not someone who the, the, uh, who just says, okay, just perform in jeans and a t-shirt or, or, or something. Uh, so, so I like you know, some of the formalities, but it shouldn't be a stuffy atmosphere and everybody should feel welcome and everybody should, should enjoy the music regardless of whether or not they know the rules of you're not, you know, do you clap in between movements or not? That shouldn't matter, like those, those sorts of things. But we should per play in in new venues and unconventional venues perhaps and reach new audiences that way and the younger audiences invariably as soon as you start playing like shoot, there they are and like you're live on the internet and and then i'll like see how the, the cell phones out of the corner of my eyes so, <laughs> so, well, so you're saying something that really just strikes me here you know the thing that jumps out of me is there mm -hmm. is that you know when it comes to mastery which is, i guess is the theme that we're touching on here we'll be talking about as once we you know as we as we go deeper and deeper into this conversation but one thing that struck me about that is sometimes when we think about mastery, you know, watching a master athlete. I was just watching Roger Federer um, um, work his way into the semifinals of Wimbledon, B 
be it that we go to a, a concert, watch a concert pianist or a you know, prima ballerina or what have you, or anybody's a master of the craft or a top surgeon. I was talking to a top surgeon from the other mm. day um, and so on. Often we, we think of that in those, you know, the beautiful setting of where they work and then the pianist sits down and doom, 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 and, it, and it's all go. But there's something lovely about what you talk about, which is, okay, it's all very well if I'm a master um, meditator when everything is beautifully calm and serene. But what am I like in the madness of everyday life? And I love that that you mentioned there, that, you know, that, that invitation for um, people in whatever their field to take, are we taking whatever it is that we're good at um, to those people who would benefit from it, which is an interesting challenge for somebody who's on that path to be really great at what they do, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. And and just just to finish that thought, what what I like, there's there's something special about live performance and performing really just for that audience. So so I do find, I've I've done performances where I knew in advance, okay, I'm going to record this. It'll be an audio or video recording because this might be valuable to me. But then what what I what I find is, I'm uh, my focus shifts. I'm, I'm my focus shifts from okay, I, I want to communicate this music and these emotions as as well as I can right now to my audience right now. And then from, from that, the focus can too easily become, oh, well, don't make any mistakes because this is recorded for posterity. And and, and I don't like that. So so I, I do ask my audiences, okay, let's do like no cell phones. This is just for you for, for this moment. And and it gives me it, it, it gives me more freedom. And invariably what happens is I play better in that situation. I make less mistakes. Yeah. Because it it depends on what your focus is. If if the focus then is on oh well, what if I make make a mistake? Then you're much more likely to make the mistake. And if your fo mm -hmm. focus is on uh, on on the message that you want to communicate, and then trusting that you've done all the work, all the preparation you, as much as you can, and then giving yourself some permission to let go and say, okay, I'm not going to be perfect. No, no matter what happens, it's not going to be up to to standards of perfection. There's always going to be something. That, that could be better like and and you you try your very very hardest and all in your practice to to be as accurate as possible as consistent as possible and make it as beautiful as possible and listen as carefully as possible but there's always going to be something well you know what's lovely about that as you were just walking us through that i, I was just the, the, a thought just popped into my mind as as sometimes happens when you know when you're when you're coaching when you're interviewing people because you you the the the, the person you're speaking to um, is you know he, he is sharing all sorts of things and, and therefore all sorts of insights and things are coming to you and I was going to ask that question do you is that to your mind a difference between perfection and mastery because we can on paper think oh yes well mastery should be perfection but I love the fact that you're inviting us to look beyond this a very simple perhaps red herring of what our perception of of, of mastery uh, um, is well it's it's a move it, mastery is a moving target actually and i i would never i guess other people would say oh well you have a certain mastery of the piano but i would never never actually say that okay because i always see the the gap it's like you get closer and closer it's kind of kind of like you know the, the those equations where they they're there's an asymptote. They're always approaching, they're getting closer and closer and they're closer to, to something, to some line or some number, but they never quite get there. So th that's what I find. If if you progress, let's let's call it a mastery spectrum, right? If you if you really push towards a certain mastery of a certain skill or discipline, then the closer you get, then the more zoomed in you are, the more you see. Oh, there's always so much farther that, that you can go. So it, it's always a moving target. And that, and that's the nature of it. That, that's what I found. And I, I tell my students, if if I have, you know, let's say I have students who are who are beginners, and and then let's say there's a tolerance of error, like a margin of error of like, let's say this much, and then students who are more advanced, and then okay, well there's there's a smaller margin of error. But what happens is that we come to expect more of ourselves. Yeah. But the, the the trick though is, and this this is a, an issue now. Like every, I'm exposing all my insecurities, right? <laughs> but but this is an issue that that I've struggled with a, a lot, just just personally, and I find that that's it's really relevant to to teaching 
it's really relevant to coaching and you know especially uh, like most of all to, to me it's really relevant to, to myself and and telling myself like giving giving myself permission that that realizing that okay it, it can't be perfect because even if i get it if, if i before if, if i define perfection as this if i could only get to this point then then that to me oh, that would be like a perfect performance but then you know you work really really hard over years and you get to that point and then you know you realize oh no no perfection wasn't here like i thought it's actually somewhere over here. That's really beautiful and so, it's so useful and so insightful. Let's um, talk a little bit. It'll be really good to talk a little bit about yourself, Velvet. You know, it'd be good to just talk a little bit about yourself, your journey. And the reasons why I love interviewing people is that I love meeting interesting people, hearing their, their stories, their journeys, their insights. Um, and I find that um, when I'm working with people, I just find that hearing from people who are really good at what they do, and anything is really just in, 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 incredibly insightful and, and, and empowering and just engaging, and that's how we, how we learn and we grow. Tell us a little bit about your story, because actually all I know is that a wonderful contact of, uh, uh, of mine, of ours, um, who has already done some really fascinating um, uh, um, work around music and healing, uh, um, uh, David Greenberg, who, who we both know, um, I, I, I said, aha, You've got to get in touch with Albert, who's currently based, who's based in Austria, you know, a fantastic musician doing incredible work and so on. And so we then had a chat literally just last week and I thought, hey, I've got to interview you. And, and what little I know is that you're somebody who was drawn to the piano from the age of 17. For many of us, that'd be very young, but actually in the world of somebody who's wanting to be classical pianist, I, um, I understand that that's, that that's not so young at all. You had a real passion. You wanted to study at the top school, um, one of the top schools in terms of um, classical piano. Um, there were all sorts of personal challenge. There's then health challenges. Um, you've taken on some of the most challenging pieces to be able to play. And beyond that, and beyond the realm of music, you recorded CDs. Beyond that, um, you're also a coach. You also speak. You inspire. You educate. Um, and there's work that you're doing also with creatives. But I'd love to hear a little bit about your story in your own words, right? Because we all have different takes and stories, and I guess you're introduced in so many different ways when, you, when you're traveling and when you're doing your work. But it'd be lovely to hear a bit about yourself in your own words. Oh, it's a very kind introduction. So, so thank you. I hope I could live up to it. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's true. I am a late starter at the piano. I, I, I did have an opportunity uh, when, when I was young, and it, it certainly didn't pan out because I didn't I grow up in an, I, I come from Pennsylvania, the suburbs, and I don't come from an environment in which classical music played any role whatsoever. So if anything, it was actually the opposite where classical music was, you know, something looked down upon rather than something looked, looked up to. Uh, and as, as a result, I never really heard it. Uh, and, and my piano teacher as a child just fired me because I, she couldn't get me to read music. And she just told my mother to take your money every week and throw it in the garbage. Albert will never be able to play the piano. She and literally it, said that. Yeah, and, and it didn't. It actually didn't matter to me at the time. I, I wasn't like particularly offended because I was just a little boy and I didn't really care. Uh, and and then this is this is really embarrassing. But but when I was, I'm, I must have been thirteen. Tw tw yeah, I th yeah, I think it must have been about thirteen. Uh, we were living in in a Pittsburgh suburb, suburb at the time, and. All of the schools in the Pittsburgh area were invited to the Pittsburgh Symphony one day, uh, and the the symphony uh, played a particular like a, a program that was geared towards young people. And when I think now, as an adult, as a classical musician, and I think, oh, what a, what a great thing! And this what a, what a golden opportunity. Thing is, I, I wasn't very receptive to it, and neither were most of the other kids there uh, and I joined everybody in just shooting spit wads at the orchestra uh, and I, I'm embarrassed to admit and then they, they played a, a symphony by Haydn in which which Haydn actually wrote in protest to he, he was he was pro protesting I think some some payment terms or the musicians weren't getting paid or something so so Haydn who was very well known for his sense of humor uh, wrote a symphony in which 
all of the members of the orchestra just get up one by one and leave the stage. So, <laughs> so a buddy and I just figured that'd be really cute if we just got up and, and left. So, so I really, I really couldn't care less like at the time about classical music, but that was like the one opportunity that I had in my childhood uh, to be introduced to it. And I didn't pay attention. I just wasn't listening. I just didn't care. And, and that's, that's really a shame. And, and, where did the, and you know, Albert, but where did the, where did the um, piano, where did the call to the piano come from? Because you talked a little bit about um, being raised in Pennsylvania. It, it wasn't an area whereby where you, that, that, that classical music, music was in terms of family everything listened to. Um, but nonetheless, you had piano, piano, unless where did that, was it a call that you had to piano with, 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 with the family interest in other types of music for you to play the piano on? Where did, where did the piano emerge from? Well, uh, my, my older brother uh, did, did actually take lessons. And so, so, so he, he played a little bit. So, so that was at least there. Mm. Uh, and, and, and then I, I actually attribute this, uh, sparking my interest uh, to a friend I had on the cross country and track team in high school who, who was this fantastic jazz guitarist and he used to play in the jazz clubs in Pittsburgh. And he was always talking about these great jazz musicians. So, so it got me curious. I was, you know, interested interested at the time in the kind of the idea of music because it was fascinating. But that I didn't yet have the feeling that I had found my music, so, so to speak, like what the the, the music that, that really spoke to me, or that even I, I could express myself. But but I thought, okay, maybe I'll try to to play a few pop songs and I signed up with the local teacher down the street, uh, kind of like the nice little old lady down the street. Right. Uh, and, and she was a very highly educated opera singer and some of the best, uh, some of the best music schools. Uh, I, and, and she introduced me to classical music. Mm. And for me, it was, it was like love at first sight or love, you know, at first hearing, at least, uh, and uh, the, that it was the passion then that drove me. And then I discovered then very quickly that I had the aptitude for it. I had I had two things that were necessary. One is I had the finger somehow. I don't I don't know how I had it because I'm, I'm clumsy at everything else. Like I joke around, I could play any sports as long as there's no ball. <laughs> right? I, but somehow I had the fingers for it, so I had the the speed, so, so some natural facility. And I had the passion and the interest, but I was missing everything else. All, everything else, like really, truly, had had to be taught. Uh, I mean, I, I caught on pretty quickly, but there was a huge amount to, to make up. And I didn't know at the time that what I was attempting, you know, was considered impossible. That it's just a considered a thing. Even even when I when I came to Vienna, then I was advised by by one of the professors, like just keep this a secret that don't tell them that you only started playing piano a few years ago because they, they just, they'll discount you altogether because they expect oh, everybody to be playing from three or four or five. Cool there. So, so just so that for the, the casual viewer who perhaps isn't um, experienced in some of this stuff. So, but so, so you, 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 you found that there was some of the natural aptitude there. You had the fingers that the finger speed and so on. Lots of the other stuff, had to be learned mm -hmm. but then presumably it sounds as though then you, you as you said you fell in love with it you fell in love with the music it called to you um, and over time you're called to Vienna presumably because that was one of the top schools um, and then it's interesting this conversation that you talk about where when the teacher said you know don't tell people that you came to piano relatively late is that because there's there's an idea that you what should be playing piano from the age of three four five six as often you yeah. often Something enough to think like sports. Oh yeah, they were play They picked up the tennis racket from the age of three or four. They were, you know, they were playing around. Is is it is it similar in when it it's, comes? It's to exactly that. that. It, it it's the same thing. And uh, in in the U.S., we don't have the same kind of system that exists in some other countries, where if if there's a talented child, so let's say a child is talented in music or in sports or in dance, right? Then then there are special schools that that they can go to, so they don't even attend than normal schools, normal high schools. And they've just like really focused on this and been and, and gone to, they, they went to the best teachers then uh, who, who trained them systematically step by step so that by the time they're 17, they're winning international competitions. 
Uh, and I, I didn't realize uh, at, at the time, that, like that this was, I had this kind of impossible task ahead of me, uh, but I'm really, really grateful uh, that I found teachers and mentors who took me under their wing. Mm -hmm. they, they recognized my talent, recognized that, that I had professional potential uh, and then really, really spent the time with me to help me to, to help fill in the gaps. And what was, you know, after that, what, what was, um, so how old were you when you began, uh, when, when, when you found yourself in Vienna, which I imagine was also, presumably, that's also a big step, right? Because um, yeah. uh, you're traveling to a completely different continent, different country, um, perhaps, you know, different, uh, you know, uh, um, language issues that, you know, are obviously mm -hmm. in Europe, uh, you know, lots of people also do speak English, but, you know, culturally you're in a different environment. Um, what, can, what was it? What was your aspiration when you set off um, for Vienna? What, did, what was it you wanted to achieve? And did you feel that you had no choice but to travel to Vienna? Or was that the, was that the kind of mecca, if you like? Was that the, what, tell us a little bit about that, because I imagine there's so much wrapped up in that. Yeah, well, uh, in, in a way, I felt that I didn't really have a choice because I had no money. I, I didn't have any support from my family, so I had to find some way to to, to get through college. And I was, you know, loading up my schedule, uh, my, my my course schedule, and working a side job in the library, uh, and practicing. You know, I always said I have to practice more hours than I sleep, and that's a, that's what I called a good day. Uh, and I can't I can't quite do that anymore, <laughs> right? But I, but but I really really pushed myself, and then I didn't I didn't even have fifty dollars to like for a bus ticket from Pennsylvania to New York City so I could audition at, at Juilliard, let, let alone, you know, the, the application fee and whatever. So I figured I, this, is, this is what I must do. This is my, I, I have one opportunity. I, I applied for the Fulbright scholarship to Vienna uh, and because it didn't cost anything. It was just extremely difficult to, to get it. I, I later learned that, that I was the first pianist in nine or ten years to, to, to be awarded a, a Fulbright scholarship to Vienna. Uh, and the, the, but I really they, I burned all my bridges. So so when when you do so, so I guess so, 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 sorry to use so many cliches, but when you put all your eggs in one basket and you burn your bridges and and you don't give yourself a way out, you, you say okay, I must do this. Then you you often find the way. Right. And, so and, and, were, so so there were the financial challenges um, to get there, and then um, from what I've uh, then heard and read and watched. But then there were um, physical challenges, there were health challenges, and that came along along the way. And I would imagine for piano, that's, um, I, I would imagine playing classical piano is pretty physically de demanding. Can yeah. you tell us a little bit about, about that and uh, a, a, about that whole phase? Yeah, that, I went through an extremely challenging time that, that, that took several years to, to, to really uh, resolve. And the, it was, back when I was uh, 10 or 11 years old, uh, there was just a regular checkup and the doctor uh, discovered that, that my, my spine is like pretty curved. And the assumption is, okay, it's probably just genetic, like whatever it is. And they can't really say exactly where it comes from. But, you know, fortunately, like some, some kids, especially when, when, they, when they grow, have uh, a significantly worse curve. Uh, and then they have to put it in the brace. Uh, some people require surgery. And in my case, the doctor said, okay, let's just keep an eye on it and hopefully it won't get too much worse and you know at least the good thing is i was able to participate in activities like sports mm. but but then it came to the point where i had a lot of pressure i was in a, a foreign country uh, and trying some way to to make it on my own and and trying to like preparing for international piano competitions and and putting in all all the hours practicing and that like with with the the constant like physical pressure that that all those hours of of practicing demand uh, and combined with a less than optimal playing technique where i hadn't yeah i was so t i was just very tense mm -hmm. physically I'm, I'm always like really surprised when when people describe me oh like you're, you're actually you're you're a calm person because I, I feel like oh i'm like totally <laughs> agitated or something right but but i had to learn how to how to relax them, how to, how to let go as part of my playing technique. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but, but with, with 
you know, with all that pressure combined with the my, my spine issue, eventually I just couldn't play the piano anymore. Mm -hmm. And I was in a lot of pain around the clock. I, I couldn't even lie in bed and hold a book without pain shooting all the way down my arm. And and, and some and I, I made so many attempts. I was just completely desperate. I spent my last euro uh, uh, like, like trying to find some kind of therapy, like going from one doctor to another, to trying physical therapy. I was trying massage therapy. I was uh, trying to, to uh, acupuncture and acupressure and this and that. Like, I, I tried to, like uh, many different things and I could get temporary relief but no long-term solution and i knew and it's this during a period of time where you were technically studying on that path to um to to to, to advance as a classical pianist was that during that time or was it after yeah. no it was it was during that time yeah. So, yeah, so, so i was i was forced then to drop out of the vienna conservatory uh, as a result because i i simply physically i just couldn't do it i couldn't put in the pr the, the practice hours and I, I just kept trying and i would make some progress and then there would there'd be something that just put me to, you know it, it's like the 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 ancient greek legend of sisyphus is they like, pushing the big boulder up the hill and then the boulder mm. always comes rolling back down and it, and it felt like that and i felt like i was completely stuck and I knew deep down that that the only the only solution for me was really to rebuild my body. Right. If I don't do it, if I don't rebuild my body, and if I don't rebuild my piano technique, basically from the ground up, then I'm not going to be able to solve this long term. There's a moment in that um, for many people, I'd imagine, in their life journey, whereby this point is okay. Um, yeah, I want to I want to play piano. I want to be great at playing piano. I want to be a classical pianist. I've made all these efforts um, despite financial pressures and despite the fact I, I, I didn't get the support that may have also been helpful to me. I've got my way to um, a acclaimed school and now this is happening to me. You know, this can be a narrative that, that and okay, it's clearly not meant to be. Do you, um, if we kind of almost jump forward for a moment, um, the Albert, who's also an educator, a coach, a speaker, um, and who's given many, many um, a, a, um, talks. Do you often hear where people will kind of almost segue with you at that part of your journey and say, this is where I'm at, Albert. Do you know what? Um, I'm in this particular field. I'm trying all these things to make it happen, but all of these setbacks. I, I, just, want to, I just wonder if you'll kind of comment about that part in the road journey, because, of course, this, this road, if we're talking about it, to mastery, as elusive as it may well be and ever-changing and winding as we've begun to already explore. But this is one, many people don't make it beyond a couple of junctions along this, this freeway, this motorway. Um, have you got any observations at those times? And I guess for everybody that have those different situations, of boxing seems to block their progress, it might be a health challenge, it might well be financial that they haven't got the money to do whatever it is that they wanted to do. I'd love any thoughts and perspectives there from you on that. You, you just articulated that there was this realization that you needed to rebuild the body and rebuild your way of playing in order to overcome those hurdles. But I'd love any thoughts about that kind of stage where people just find themselves stuck and frustrated and often never be, move beyond that point. Sometimes blame will come in here, won't it? Blaming other people, parents, family, the world. Um, you name it. <laughs> yeah, it depends on it depends on what we're trying to accomplish, mm -hmm. and the, there there are a couple of things. I mean, if I, in we, we okay, we we should pursue at least professionally, uh, not just what we love, but also what we could really excel at. And I think that's a really important point because sometimes. I have, and I, I hate to say it this way because I, I think like people, everybody should, should pursue music on some level, just focusing on music for the time being. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's not for everybody professionally. Mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. and some, sometimes I have had people who have, who have contacted me and said, oh, well, I, I, I came across your story and I find it really inspiring. And, you know, I started, I also started playing it at, 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 uh, in my late teens. And 
now it's a few years later and I, I, I want to, I want to do this professionally and like, here's where I am now. And if, like, it's, if, if, if they really have the talent, then, then, then go for it. Mm -hmm. Right. But if you don't really have the talent, then this should be your hobby. Yeah. I love this point that you're saying out there. I, I, it's such an important and, and a beautifully articulated point that I want to just kind of must pause and meditate on that and just sit with that and explore that for a moment because it's just beautifully put. Um, that, you know, we should, you know, that point about, well, it, you know, it depends what you want. And, and this thing about, in terms of what we're going after professionally, what is it that you can really excel at? Um, if, if you really want, to, I, and, and I guess that means asking ourselves some really tough questions. Uh, and some of that, I guess, is going to be down to the talent. Do I have the, oh, well, I guess, do I have the passion? Do I have that kind of aptitude for it from those gifts? And do I seem to have that kind of talent or that raw talent? And that passion, and I'm really, really hungry for it. And I guess with so many things, you can test that, isn't it, with people? And I see that in so many um, fields. I, I, I find that a lot of time, particularly as a coach, when I'm coaching people, particularly people who are thinking about starting or growing their own business, I can tell very early on about their their hunger, their passion, and actually what's their ability and what's their and what's their skills. And um, I think it's a really, really good point. And you know, staying with music for a while, I certainly know when I was pursuing music. I think one of the things I realised over time was that um, I, I think I, I, you know, I got a few years into music and I realized just how much work this pop, kind of pop, you know, popular, the popular realm of music, um, pop, soul, and, and so on, but how much there was to it. And I guess, I guess part of that is being honest with oneself. And I guess part of that is also getting enough of a sound sounding from other people and people who know and people who you're ex to get a sense of that, because I guess sometimes we won't always know that, or we can delude ourselves. So any any other mm -hmm. points about that? That thing that we're, we're concerned? Cause yeah, I, I do. Pain, can't they? A lot of time, energy, yeah. money. Well, I, I do. I do fully agree with that. So, so I mean, you have to be cut out for the thing that you want to pursue. But, but the other the the, the other great aspect is the okay. Like, I really do believe that everybody can excel at something, mm. right? And 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 ideally what that thing is th that should also be in an area where we can where, where we could really make some kind of contribution to mm -hmm. to to, uh, to to society to the world in, in in some way just just to to other people and then if you see wait a second i'm really good at this one thing and maybe i could be great at it like i could really excel in this area and it's something that that can make an impact on other people's lives in 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 some way. Then that's then these things harmonize, and I, so I think that's what's really worth pursuing. It's it's kind of like a, the like a, okay, I'm good at playing the piano at least when I practice a lot, uh, but I I really suck at a lot of things, right? So so I certainly don't want to delude myself and into like okay I, I i do sports because sports uh, for for me that's that was my path to re rebuilding my body and and to uh, getting back to to the piano getting back to to being able to to play regularly and and, and perform and and, and uh, <laughs> i'm sorry this this seems like awfully pretentious but i really did finish this just last week right for for, for this for the second time and that's interesting because I'm in that area, in the area of sports right now, I have very little talent and I had to, I had to start completely from scratch, but I would, I would delude myself if I thought, Oh, well, let me, you know, if, if I worked like round the clock and only did this in like some fantasy world. Right. And I had the best coaches and, and everything down to an exact science and I optimized my body's performance. I still wouldn't even come close to the people who really excel at triathlon. Like, yeah. like not not a chance. They're so far ahead because they have like this incredible talent. But tell us something about, about this. There's something I'm I, I'm then struck by about this. Um, when you touched on that that part of the rebuilding, because I think you beautifully dealt with this element of, you know, spot that thing that you're really good at and that you can excel at. And of course, you know, we'll we'll all have. That. That's the magical thing about life is that those different areas that might take some searching to find. But um, you had this passion and this um, skill for, for piano, for classical piano playing. Um, 
and there was this there were these there were these challenges and then this thing about this rebuilding i'm, I'm really curious about this because i've got a hunch that uh, in in some way degree or thing it's interesting you're talking about greek mythology and um, briefly and, and telling stories that you know how in so many stories there are the you know you somebody sets off on a path and then there's this challenge and there's that challenge you know that classic hero story and then there are pitfalls and so on so often you'll hear it in so many times if you hear so many people who are skilled in anything uh, sports entertainment business and um, the workplace there were moments of real challenges and then somehow they re-align themselves. Do you feel that there's something about, do you think there's something almost inevitable um, when you're on your own path to have to somehow reconfigure things? Sometimes it might be a, a, actually very, very serious as in your case, you know, we, 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 we're faced with serious physical challenges. But sometimes it might well just be that it might be just all sorts of blocks or problems. I mean, I, I, I certainly feel um, there was some of that. I certainly feel as though it was some of the times that were really challenging career-wise, that if I hadn't had those, the times of being made redundant, if I hadn't had the time of not making it as a singer and, 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 and um, experiencing all those challenges, I wouldn't have been curious to ask myself, okay, well, what are these challenges that affect singers and then to and go on this journey that led me to retrain as a coach to want to work with singers, performers, creatives, and all sorts of other people. And if they hadn't been all sorts of ups and downs, um, and then things that I found within my own craft that did and didn't chime with me, I wouldn't have found my own authentic voice and what I could bring to the table. And I love that bit you were saying before about you've also got to find that thing that you could bring to the world. Because if I'm very honest, I'm not sure that apart from, I was just thinking about this the other day, actually, I'm not sure that as a singer performer back when I was first performing, um, I'm not sure I was bringing anything to the world other than what Rashid Okunlari wanted to be a star. Uh, yeah, that's such a great point. That I'm so glad you mentioned that because the, I, I think motives matter. Mm -hmm. and, and what what is our what is our true motivation? Is it is it simply about our own ego, mm -hmm. uh, or is is there is there some way that that we really can contribute? Mm -hmm. I think that's that's a that's a fundamental distinction, and and that's that's also then a, a guiding principle uh, mm -hmm. for me. I mean, it's, it's not it's not to say. I mean, I, I think a, a healthy ego is is necessary to accomplishing some things. It's a, I think it's good to be ambitious, mm -hmm. right? But do we want to be ambitious just so to, just so I could pretend? Oh, I'm more important than you or the next guy or whatever. Or is there can can, can we marry that ambition uh, to, to to something that, that, that can really make a difference mm. and, and, and focus on that. I would so agree. I would so agree with that. And I think that, um, I think what I found, um, I think there's something very, very powerful at that point um, in the road because, for example, earlier on today, I, I, I happened to be lucky enough, I was asked to, um, to a, a, a National Health Service Trust that I do some work with, I do some work with a number of um, National Health Service Trust here in the UK, and um, I was asked to give a, a little talk during a uh, an event. I went along, gave a little bit of talk, a, a bit of a talk, and I felt very humbled because I was just saying, as I often share, that um, just inviting them to pause and reflect about the magical gifts they have. Here I was, sat in front of a room full of people, nurses, doctors, surgeons administrators, all sorts of people in this, uh, healers, people who save people's lives, people who um, enrich the quality of people's lives. And um, I realized somewhere along the, along the line of my own journey that I was lucky enough to have a skill and a talent which was around helping other people spot and realize and recognize and pursue their own, well, first and foremost, to see themselves, to, I mean, to really see their self to embrace their self, to, to really find real self-worth, self-esteem, and then to begin to find and embody themselves in the world. And that's very, very different to where I was at as a journey as a singer. Don't get me wrong, it was all part of the same, you know, it all, it was kind of part along the journey. But I think that for me, there's a real big, and I'm glad you mentioned it too, because I think there's a real big distinction when somebody um, is really doing their life's work 
I think that for me, that's what this bit about mastering your craft is really about. You're doing your life's work. And that really is about, for me, I, I think it is absolutely about um, enabling others. If, you know, I, I, I have the same, you know, if I, if I take, then I alone gain. But if I share, then at least two people's lives are enriched. If I take, I alone gain. Yeah, yippee. Yeah, good, good yeah. Enough for me. But if I share, if I contribute, then at least I still benefit because I've put something in. But somebody else is going to benefit because they get something from it. And, and, mm -hmm. and I think without that, whatever you're doing, okay, good for you, great. <laughs> mm. But there's no magic in it, right? Uh, so it's really beautifully said. Like for, for me, a great metaphor is lighting another torch. Mm -hmm. And then, then you have two bright lights, not just one. Right. And, and you don't lose anything because because so, so often so, so so often we think oh if I share this if I give this then and then, then there's less for myself and but that's that's exactly the kind of of mentality then that prevents us from from achieving what we could really achieve. Can you tell us a little bit, Albert, then about the there was the rebuilding journey? Um, I'd I'd love for you to tell us about that moment when. If there was one moment, there was a moment. Oh yeah. Ah, tell us about that that moment because I'd love to know how you then found what your work and your contribution is, and it'll be lovely to tell the viewers a little bit about the blend of the things that you're doing now and what that life's work is about for you. It'll be lovely just to hear about that moment and how things have unfolded. Yeah. Well, there was. If if you're referring to this particular moment, I, I did have a turnaround moment. And like w way back when, when I was in a lot of pain, I would make just this little bit of progress and then have a setback, a little more progress and then have a setback. Uh, and it, you know, it was two steps forward, three steps back. And if I was lucky, it was three steps forward, two steps back, right? But then I, I did have a moment where I realized, you know what, I'm still focused on the pain. Mm -hmm. My whole goal here is just get out of pain. Mm -hmm. So then when I, when I stopped and thought to myself, and okay, if what do I really want? And I thought, okay, well, I actually really want to be fit and healthy. And it's not simply the absence of pain. I, what if, so if I'm at, you know, minus seven, minus eight, minus nine in this area, it's not about, oh, can I get closer to zero? But it's like, what, like, what if I turn this around? What would the complete opposite of this be if physically I were, I were doing like amazingly well, right? And, and then immediately the, the thing that came to my mind was oh, Iron Man, right? Mm -hmm. And, the, and this, this just remained some kind of some crazy fantasy, not even a dream in my mind until I was lucky enough one day a few years ago to be hanging out with a wonderful group of friends. We were in Dublin at, at the time. Uh, and, and, you know, we were all talking about like the, the, our bucket list basically. And, and I somehow let this slip. And, you know, there are a lot of people who would say, even if you're just joking around with your friends, right? It's, oh, yeah, right. It's crazy or whatever. But, but they actually, there's a very inspiring group, group of friends. And they just immediately like lit up and just all pointed it at me. And in a chorus, I said, Iron Man, you're our Iron Man. I'm like, oh, you guys aren't going to let me off the hook, are you? So, so I, I started training like that week. Right. I, and and so, so then I took it seriously. And, and eventually just last year, I, I, I accomplished the goal. I, and that was the one thing that, that really allowed me to turn it around, at least in terms of health. And, and then there's, there's a really, there's a really, really hard thing. Like when, when you're going through something, when you're going through some painful uh, phase, some, some painful experience, then like you, you have like this big obstacle in front of you. Right, and you're you're trying and trying and trying, and you think, oh, if if only this obstacle weren't there, then, and uh, sorry, it was, it was Siri thought I was talking to her. She saw it talking in the background. I don't, I don't know what I said, but but you have this big it's obstacle. Piano. It's the piano that we can see in the background. Maybe That's right. <laughs> Calling me to practice, right? The but you you have you, you we think that oh, if I could only get rid of this this obstacle, then. But we don't realize at the time, or most often we don't realize that that obstacle, that's the point. Like that's what we're supposed to, like we, 
that is there to help us grow. And it was only through all these obstacles. And I think you had a similar experience as well. It's, it's only through encountering the, the obstacles that, that you then can see, hey, oh, wait a second. I've found a way around or through all of these. And actually, this is something that could be valuable for, for other people. Mm. Yes, yeah, there's something about that. And I think there's something about how, I, I wonder if that, let's use that, the obstacle, um, which I think can be so many, it can be so many different things, isn't it? It can be, it can be, I have imagined it can be real, it can be imagined, it can be this, it can be that, it can be financial, it can be physical, it can be so many different things. I think that sometimes there's something about, uh, a, a friend of mine um, who is a very talented songwriter, and he, um, he wrote a song once and there was a line that he said, and the line in this song goes, the rush all go the same way. In other words, he's describing, I think he was, walking up a bridge one day and um, I don't know where to, I don't know if he worked, if he was going to work or, you know, he was going off somewhere. But he was, he was, he was, he was, he was walking and, and noticed that everybody else was going in the other direction. And, and there's something about that that really struck me. And I think that sometimes we can have that moment in life whereby it even, and I often talk to people about this, that even sometimes all the evidence or all the seeming evidence or all the facts or all the reality is pointing in a different direction. But sometimes you just have this hunch, you just have this call to do something. I certainly, I, I mean, so what you say really chimes with me because I certainly feel as though, I remember very, very clearly um, at one point in my career, in fact, it was an interesting moment where I had been accepted to give my first really big talk at a big personal development conference here at someone like, Else call, or, you know, someone like Olympia here in London, a big show. And, you know, I'd been given a speaking gig and it was, you know, it's um, probably over 10 years ago now. And it was a big deal. Um, and I had just recorded at that time my second um, audio talk CD called Become Who You Are, which is the tagline of, you know, the tagline of the work, Become Who You Are. And I remember really clearly because my very first CD was a very, very traditional run-of-the-mill, if you like, coaching thing. It was fine, but it's just so many other people have done it. And I remember really clearly, you know, but writing the sleeve notes from, I remember recording this CD and writing the sleeve notes. Only when I wrote the sleeve notes, which were kind of a stream of consciousness of this first CD, I thought, you know what, this CD's okay, but the sleeve notes are where the magic is at. You could kind of throw away the CD and keep just the sleeve notes, and that's the magic. And then I went in to record my second CD, Become Who You Are, and I approached it like I would approach music. I had the song titles, and I went in and I recorded this CD as a stream of consciousness. The whole thing just flowed. Just the whole thing flowed. It's one of the things I'm most proud of. So when I got the speaking gig, I thought, okay, what well, I'm going to speak of, I thought, well, I can only speak of um, this Become Who You Are thing. And so I arrived at the day of this, um, this big event and I was walking around lots of stores and I was seeing things and lots of things, but they just didn't chime with me. They were fine, but they're very much traditional um, coaching, goal setting stuff, which is fine. It's very valid. It's an important part of the coaching thing. But a lot of it left me cold because for me, I always felt as though goals are not the whole story. Goals are just, a, they're, they're a stop off point. Um, and, there's all, and I also always felt as though there's a narrative often around that, you know, there's a narrative that even the personal development industry can fall into, which it's not cared for, which is that, okay, you're, you're here, but you, you should be here. You should be better then which is fine on one level, but what, it can, what can happen, people can fall into the trap of not seeing the magic they actually have because they, they've never explored how magical they can be. So they have this sense that I could be here, but unless one's actually explored one's own magic, one's own gifts, one's own talent. And sometimes I think what I love about your story is that you yourself had to reconnect to that um, in your own way, um, your own body, your own health, your own well-being, your own work, what music meant to you. And I think it's at that moment so at that moment, it was really interesting. I went around and all those things didn't chime with me. And then I had to go out and give this talk. And the moment when I walked out, you know, kind of center stage and there was an audience, it reminded me of what it's like to be a singer. There's an audience. And, and of course, I couldn't really plan this talk because the CD was a stream of consciousness. I kind of knew how the CD, CD, CD went, but it had to be alive. Again, you, you know, it's like you may have recorded the CD, you know, you recorded it, but when it's live, it's still a different animal. It's the same, but it's... Absolutely, yeah. So I walked out, and I suddenly just had this thing, aha, this is what it's like. So that's when my life, everything kept went full circle. I thought, aha, 
the performer, the person who wanted to be the singer, the thingy, the thingy, the da da da, they all, they all, they all blended into one. And so that was a very, very powerful moment for me. But I, I, I think there is something about not being afraid to, uh, and, and recognizing and knowing that how your craft presents itself to you may be completely different to everybody else who does it. And, and that is a wonderful gift. I mean, I don't know if you've got any thoughts or feelings around that, but I just wanted to, to share that. <laughs> mm. Yeah, beautifully said, Be beautifully said. Do you mean how are like my individual or, or a person's individual craft might come across to other people or it's almost that, or other practitioners uh, of that craft? It's almost, it's almost as though um, the journey it's almost like, I guess it's a number of things. It's like my relationship to music um, might be very different to somebody else's relationship. My, if I were an actor, my relationship to this role of playing Macbeth, this is just telling me, you know, everybody else has played this character. Everyone else has played, Elizabeth, but everyone else has played whoever this character. But for me, there's something just telling me that, there's, that this, is, this, is, there's something, this is how it needs to be expressed. The script is saying this, the director is saying that, I'm gonna honor what they're saying. But there's also something, my hunch is just telling me because I'm feeling this. And this is how yeah, this song yeah. is, to be sung, it is to be expressed. I, I'm totally with you because one of the things that, that, that classical mus musicians face nowadays is uh, because of the, we live in an age of technology, then it's possible to record performances. So you get all these perfect squeaky clean uh, recordings that are made. The, well, they, I almost said CDs. They used to be CDs, and then, uh, right? and uh, I guess now it's all like Spotify or do whatever. Uh, but 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 you, we we have these picture perfect recordings that are made by famous interpreters, and and then we think, oh, if I play this piece, you know, there's no way I could measure up to Rubinstein or to Horowitz or whoever, uh, and that can deter us from actually playing something or and and maybe even uh, like sharing the beauty of this music with other people but but i have found some other thing there's there is a connection to, in all of this for 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 me personally and and i know uh some people may this this is this is a very old fashioned belief but mm -hmm. I, I i found at least with me i can't speak for anybody else but but for, for me there, there seems to be something there i i, I, I there's, there's something about the, there's there's something completely intangible you can't put your finger on it you can't say exactly what it is uh, but about life experiences and and experiencing if you're a performing artist whether you're an actor or you're a dancer or you're a musician there's something about experiencing a wide palette of emotions and having just real life experiences of of great experiences and happy moments and joyful moments but also painful moments or even tragic moments and there's a way you could translate all of that into your art into your performance i i can't say exactly what it is i i could i think it's an important point i think it's a really important point that you mentioned there i think that i and I think, it's, I think it's a really important point and an important point for many creators and artists. I feel that, um, that the artist, the creator, the singer, the dancer, whomever, they've got their own lives and then there's their craft. Their own life is going to have all these challenges, ups and downs or whatever. Some people might be lucky, it might be easy or whatever. Other people might be all sorts of challenges. And the question is, I think that what we what we certainly know about many forms of the arts, isn't it? That some people seem to either flow through it, and some people seem to be consumed or burned by it, or that their you know that their lives end up being very tragic. And I think for me, it's all about how do we actually? It's quite ironic. I think it's quite it's almost like a paradox. Our our, our art is actually expressing emotion. That's what we do. Whether we're playing the piano, whether it is that we're singing a song be it that we're writing poetry, be it that we're painting wonderful landscapes or whatever, it, we're, we're creating wonderful things with clay or with whatever it is that we're doing. We're making wonderful films or whatever it is that we're doing. Um, and the question is, how do we then manage our own emotion? How do we use that? Um, how do we really use that? How do we channel that? How do we, 
how, how do we be grateful for that and so that we, we can use that in our work without us being banned by it personally. So mm. I think to me, I think that what I've been very grateful for and I realize now is that um, although you know, my day job is I'm a coach, motivational speaker, I, I look at many things through the lens of being um, a, a singer, performer. Well, and, and again, being a speaker, you are a performer. So for me, there's something about the performer, the, that, that, that creative. And, and so I'm very aware that when I've got to sing a song, all of those experiences are really so, so useful because I can just automatically, um, and I think there's something about what you said about when you were talking before about one's purpose. It means that I can, there's a song there, and I can almost, um, I, I can tap into something almost intuitively, somewhere between my own experience and life's experience that's open to me. Because if my, if my heart were the channel to it, I can then open my mouth and then something can be sung or I can express it. Uh, and for me, there's something about that that is so beautiful, the invitation with art and with, with experiences that you say. I think there's something about that. Then we're, we're, we're able to then, whatever that piece is, whatever that play is, whatever that painting is, we're able to express it with more, with more insight, with more expression, with more heart, with more tenderness, with more empathy than, than perhaps we could before. And that's such a great thing about life's ups and downs. I, I think what you say there is... A, is really important and I think that sometimes we miss it by being so caught up with my own my own perceptions of how life should be or that I've been hard done by because I guess going back to your own story you know there could be all sorts of good reasons why you could throw in the towel my family aren't supportive of me you know my body's not supporting me to be able to do this thing I haven't got the money to do that and um, do you feel, I mean, I just wonder, Albert, um, what, what are the, I mean, as we begin to uh, um, wrap up, what are the, through, through, through life, what are the real life lessons that you've learned along this journey? And it would be nice to then move on to what you're doing now and what your aspirations are moving forward. What have been the real core lessons that you've learned from this journey? Okay, one of the most important ones for me I wish you had like we had prepared this one in advance. It, it seems like this is some overwhelming question, and then <laughs> after after the interview is over, then I was oh I should have said this or this or whatever. But but just speaking spontaneously, I could at least say say, say one is 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 that I, I feel so strongly about this, right? That the 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 obstacles are the point in in, in a way. Like if, if you if you have some goal or a dream or some aspiration, whatever that is, and there's nothing standing in your way, mm. then it's not a big enough goal. <laughs> like I, 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 I must say, I just want to say to you, I, mean, I, I think when I saw the film, and there was a film on a uh, website, uh, a, a beautiful film about your, uh, about your journey, or part of your journey at least. And when you began to talk about it, I thought that's lovely because it was, an, you know, people often talk about how, um, you know, that there will be obstacles, there will be challenges, and how you respond to it. But, but your articulation of it has a, has a different and a beautiful quality to it. That, that you know, those are the point. That's, that's, that's the learning. That's, that's, that's it there. And I think there's so much. If, if I can then realize that, you know, with that school, what is the learning? How can, I, how can I use this to, and it ties in beautifully with our theme around mastering your craft. Because then if I'm good at something, but then I've suddenly got a more difficult song to sing, great, because this really challenging song where it goes here, there, and whatever. This is great. This is really going to test how good I am. Okay, this person's blocking me or whatever. I'm having this thing. Okay, how can I, what can I learn here? Um, and, and I guess it must be quite daunting though sometimes, isn't it? Because some of the chat obstacles, as in your case, they're big obstacles. So yeah, sorry to um, interject. Oh, no, no, no problem. The, 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 I think there, there, there are two things. I mean, there, there are two fundamental types of challenges like if i had to like categorize them right there and there, there are those well maybe i could put it more eloquently we can either pursue certain goals like or we could wait for which which will require us to overcome obstacles will require us to grow they require embracing uncertainty because you know people talk about your comfort zone well your comfort zone is the only reason it's your comfort zone is because you're certain within that 
that certain range. So a goal must, by definition, be outside of that. It has to be outside of your comfort zone. Otherwise, it's not a real goal, mm -hmm. right? So that means there has to be uncertainty. Mm -hmm. You you have to be on. If if you're certain that you can reach a particular goal, mm -hmm. then it's simply not big enough, mm -hmm. right? So so that's that's one aspect. So we could actually deliberately choose our challenges, or we can wait for life to hand us challenges. And that's going to happen either way, right? <laughs> but both of them really are, are opportunities for growth. Mm, I really like that. And, and that's one of the most important things that, that I learned, because when, when you're going through a hard experience, then, then you, you think that, uh, oh, I shouldn't have to have this is unfair or whatever, and you, or maybe you start playing the blame game and or, or whatever it is, or you throw the pity party. <laughs> what, 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 I love that one. Yeah. <laughs> or, or what, whatever it is. And then, like, the, the hard thing is, and I, I try to, but believe me, I, I, try, I try to tell myself now if I go through, through a challenge, okay, no, it's okay. There's something that I need to learn here. That's why I have this, this challenge. There's some opportunity to grow. I, I, I remember once when I was in college, my, my music history professor invited me to his office because the, the evening before he had heard me play a big performance with the orchestra and and he called me into his office and congratulated me. He said, oh, it was a great performance. Uh, and, uh, and, and, he, and he said a couple of things that I really remember from this conversation. It really had an impact on, on me. Uh, the, the first was, okay, you, you do have a special talent. You, you, know, you have something that you, know, that, that you have something to share with the world, right? But then the other thing that he said was, you need to fall in love and get your heart broken, <laughs> right? And, and of course that happened. I didn't get the girl and whatever, I, I was crushed. And of course that happened then multiple times in my life. But, but there, there's something, what, what he was really saying is that, okay, you need to have a richer emotional experiences across the whole ex the spectrum of human emotions and not be afraid of, of the, the painful experiences. And then you have more to say through your art. Mm. And... The, it, it, it can happen, it, everybody has painful experiences, they're going to happen one way or, or another, mm -hmm. uh, but th th there is something about like, having some kind of, like that's, that's a, an obstacle of, of, of sorts, but it's, it's possible then to channel that emotionally, expressively, you could channel that into your performance, into, into your art. Right. right, I, I think that's so, so powerful. And I, what I like about that is a, um, uh, it's it's powerful. It's profound, and, and and quite simple at the same time. And um, and I think that that's one of the wins that you know. How over time, <laughs> you um, you kind of um, get what you're about or what your work is about. You kind of there comes a the moment where it makes it begin. It makes sense. Ah, oh, that's what this whole thing is about, right? Yeah. I just want to begin to wrap up by asking you. Can you tell us a little bit about um, the classical piano is one dimension, one very important aspect of your work. You record, you perform, and but there are other aspects. I mean, some of which you shared your wisdom as an educator here. Can you just tell us a little bit about the work that you do, what your life looks like today, the work that you do, and what that purpose of that work is and any aspirations that you have moving forward um, musically, educationally, or the rest of it, it'd be lovely just to hear a bit about that. Yeah, well, those, well, music and education, like, well, art, education, those are two of my three pillars for, for me. And I, I try my best every single morning when, when uh, as soon as I get up, then I, I, I think about these things and I think, okay, I have a certain amount of time today, I have a certain amount of energy t today, and so, so I need to use it or distribute that time, distribute that energy, as judiciously as I can to to be constructive, like in in these three three areas for me. So so my, my three pillars are number one is art, and that includes my my, my music, any performances, uh, re recordings, and leaving behind something that hopefully you know some years from now people like after I'm gone, hopefully there will be people who appreciate the, the, that I did this. So so there's art, there's teaching and inspiration those are the three big pillars for, for me so what i'm doing then then artistically they're, they're my performances and recordings mm -hmm. and and always striving to to improve in that area and get better and and getting better by the way doesn't simply mean 
your, your technique. It's not about, you know, can I play this the fastest? It's, like, it's, it's not a sport. It's an art. It's, it's about what we have to communicate. And it's about using our, our technique then for, for the purpose, always for artistic purpose and not simply for ourselves, but, but can, we, can we express what the, what the composer is trying to say? Mm. Can we express then, then the emotions that, that this piece is, is trying to, to, mm. to express, right? And like that particular emotional journey. Mm. And so, so that's what it's really about. So, so that's, that's the artistic pillar. And the second one for me is education. And I, I'm, I'm absolutely not self-taught as a musician. I, I, I'm autodidactic and you know certain other areas, uh, but definitely not as a musician. Mm -hmm. And as much as I threw my myself into it and learned everything that I possibly could, nothing would have come of my talent were it not for my teachers. Mm -hmm. And I was really, really fortunate that I got to work with with some of the best teachers uh, worldwide. And and if it had not been for them, then the there wouldn't be this whole pillar. So, so I feel a really strong ob obligation to just give this back and try to, I try to share it as, with as many people as possible. And what, what I'm doing now is I have a startup uh, called Keynotes and it, it's key-notes.com. Mm -hmm. I just got an offer for the unhyphenated version, but it costs like, <laughs> they want like $70,000 for it. It's like, okay, well, not, not just yet, mm -hmm. uh, but, but it's called keynotes.com and it's an it's a platform for learning piano online mm -hmm. so so there's a whole platform with with over 200 professionally recorded videos and some wow. very very detailed lessons uh, for and, and it costs less than a dollar a day so so they, I, I really put an enormous amount into into this and and now uh, we're working on on uh, making this interactive and and we're creating software tools that will help students then then build skills. So, so what my, my strong perspective in this in 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 the company, uh, I I t tell this to the team. The we cannot and must not fall in love with the technology. It's not about the technology. It's not about okay, can we, can we come up with something and patent this or that? It's not about that. Or you know, we have the fancy algorithm. It's not about that at all. It's all about learning. And how can we use technology not to replace human skill? but to help people build more skill in, in the area of music. So, so that's the focus of, of this educational pillar. And then the third one is, is inspiration and just reaching people and communicating uh, with, with people and then hopefully influencing people in some positive way. And, and there's, there's, I, I do a lot of volunteer work mm -hmm. and, and I just got back yesterday from a, a meeting with a global NGO called the Diplomatic Council, mm -hmm. and and there I, I want to see certain changes in human rights mm -hmm. and laws throughout the world. And what what I hope, and this, this is not the sort of thing that happens overnight. Mm -hmm. And the, the it, what what I what I hope is to be able to just help plant some seeds, mm -hmm. and maybe maybe years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, whatever. I just hope to live to be able to see uh, certain changes uh, in, in laws throughout the world. So, so all, all that then is, is part of this other, uh, is this, this other pillar uh, of uh, speaking and volunteer work. It's, it's the, it for realizing that it's, I, I mean, this is a cliche. That it's not about me; it's about we. But 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 it's true. Like realizing, I I, I spoke out on. Uh, I won't say now. I mean, you could look up my my TED talks. But I, mm -hmm. half a year ago, I was invited to share something very personal at, at, at TEDx San Francisco in front of an audience of a couple thousand people, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and I was scared out of my mind mm -hmm. uh, in preparing the talk. But what gave me the courage was realizing, oh, well, there are at least a, a million people, if not millions of people who are affected by, by this. Mm -hmm. And it's, I was offered a certain platform and if I could help give voice to, to other people as well, and maybe, and, and then, and since, since then I was just amazed by the exclusively positive feedback that, that the talk received. And I had many people uh, write to me or, or, or tell me that, oh, thank you. You just gave me the courage to speak out. 
Yeah. I mean, that's so powerful. And isn't it wonderful that um, there's something interesting, I think, that often happens, you know, I've got on this um, journey, isn't there, that the, <laughs> and it is cl cliche, isn't it, that I, that I, we, that um, all kind of thing, you know, that starts off often with a me journey, then there's we, okay, there's a team or whatever, and then that, 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 that bit of, of benefits all. But it is quite extraordinary, and it's quite incredible, isn't it, that, uh, 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 that germ of the seed of somebody's talent um, and when somebody embraces that talent then gives us these wonderful opportunities to contribute in so many different ways and this is quite incredible when you realize actually well I can give voice to something here I can give a little bit of time here it's quite there's something very powerful about that what's the best way for people to find you I wrote down key-notes.com for the piano stuff but if people are trying to find you is there a website for your for your your music of your art of your education I'll make sure we Post that up along with um, when I uh, with this with this with this video, which is already live, but I will add it to it. Oh, this was that's right. This was all live, wasn't it's it? Still live, we're still live. We, we yeah, can. We're, yeah. live. <laughs> we're watching this now. It's, it's all it's all on the record now. Okay, all yeah, but uh, yeah, the the main website is keynotes.com. Uh -huh. so they can right? find yeah they can find you, and they will be able to find a link back to you, and then they can just search for you, and they'll find if people were to then do well known search engine searches so if they go to keynotes will they also find stuff about other stuff about you if they're interested to discover the music or the education uh yeah i don't i don't put and on keynotes i really just focus pretty exclusively on the music education aspect i uh, but just on on youtube if you if you google my name uh, then then yep. you find uh to some talks that i gave or performances or, or whatever so, so th those are those are available uh, as well really well, I think I, I need to do a better job marketing I'm, I'm really actually pretty shy about this because to be honest if someone says okay we want to interview you for, for something that, that and we want you to talk about you that I don't really want to talk about myself but the so I am pretty pretty shy about that but I guess maybe I need to, I, I can learn you have to teach me how to market myself better, it's, I guess. it's really that bit is really funny because I remember you know very very briefly just as we wrap this up that um uh, it's funny, one of the reasons why I became a coach, um, well, I knew I wanted to become a coach because I wanted to help singers and performers on their journey and so on and, and so on. But I then found myself coaching quite a lot of people who were starting or growing their own business because, of course, my first background in being media and PR. So when I started being my own boss, I knew nothing about business. But I did know about two things. I knew about connecting with people and, uh, um, well, I, yeah, I knew how to promote myself because I'd been in that since the age of 18. And I knew how to connect and so on because I was a singer and performer. Little did I know that therefore that is very, very useful when it comes to being your own boss, do you know what I mean, in terms of that kind of side of things. But hey, we're really glad you're doing the work that you're doing. Albert, it's been such um, a real joy. Thank you so much for sharing so much. And, and you do that with so much heart, with so much warmth, and with so much um, um, compassion. You really speak in a way, and it's a real, it's a sign of a master that you can speak in a way that um, is encouraging um, uh, but in no ways um, doesn't allow for somebody else's experiences on their own journey it's a real it's a real it's a real skill it's a real skill of um, someone who does clearly the work that you're doing thank you so much for spending so much of your time here um, and um, looking forward to speaking a, a, a again thank you so much for this any last words you want to say um, before I'm going to stop the broadcasting. Any, any last words you want to say to anyone who happens to be watching this now or 10 years hence or 100 years down the line? <laughs> and, and, and any famous last words? No, I just want to say, say thank you, Rashid, for a wonderful opportunity. So, so I, I hope if there's something that we said that, that maybe can spark something in someone and inspire somebody in, in some way, then that's... A, so a, do I? I want to be part of a job. <laughs> is, is I? <laughs> 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 okay, no, great stuff. No, thank you so much. I'm going to stop press broadcast. Just to say, anyone who's tuned in, thank you so much for tuning in. Um, and uh, yeah, as Albert said, um, and search for him online or at key-notes.com, and I will put a link to that website um, here underneath this broadcast. Thank you so much for your time and for watching. I'm going to press stop broadcast night now. So goodbye, everyone who's watching. <laughs>